time here. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Excellent. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. My name is Jared Weisselman. I'm a senior editor for BuzzFeed. And uh, I think it's safe to say over the last few years, Orange is the New Black has proven its ability to find untapped talent and give them the platform they truly deserve. I mean, where would we be without Uzo Aduba, Laverne Cox, Matt McGorry, and any of the people at Litchfield? And this year, we added one more name to that list. Ladies and gentlemen, Ruby Rose. Hey. How's it going? You <laughs> it's good. I'm nervous. Don't Why? be nervous. This is, I told her, I'm like, this is the most welcoming room you could possibly have when doing an interview. It's acting, <laughs> yeah. That is Nothing but nice to know. unbridled enthusiasm. Um, congratulations on the third season of Orange is the New Black. It was an amazing addition to the world. What kind of response, besides the one we just saw in this room, have you been getting to the role? I'm, it's been crazy. Honestly, like I never, it, it exceeded all my expectations in regards to how well that role would be received, you know, and, and the fans are phenomenal and the feedback I've had from, you know, people within the industry has been fantastic and it's, how long has it been? It's been out for like a, just over a month yeah. and it would feel like it's been out for two years. I felt like within 24, within 13 hours, people had watched 13 episodes. Yeah. It was mental. Yeah, my I was phone, like, guilty, I did that. I yeah. woke up and I was like, grr, grr, grr. my phone was like, out of battery, charge it, out of battery. I'm like, <laughs> I have to turn off notifications. Like, it was bananas. This is a show. Did I say bananas? Yeah. Bananas is back. We're going to say bananas. <laughs> uh, the show has this very well known sort of secrecy going into the year. They don't want the actors talking about the show, they don't want plot things to be released. I mean, it truly was. And not until we really saw the first trailer, like, oh, Ruby Rose is in this. This is great. Uh, was The, the wink? Yeah, the, hey. I got to wink. <laughs> I mean, was the secrecy as intense on the other side of things during the audition process? How did this role come to you? I have no idea. Um, I literally still have, I should, probably should have asked, you know, found out how I actually got the role. But I believe, because I'd never been, you know, offered any kind of audition up until the point of Orange. And I'd been living in the States for two years, trying to get a manager, trying to get an agent, trying to get myself out there. And I decided to make my own work. And uh, I made a short film and it went viral. And then within, it was like serendipitous timing that within a couple of weeks, I got an email from Jen Houston's office, which, you know, I mean, it's Jen Houston's office. So I had a mini heart attack and it asked if I would be interested in auditioning for the role of Stella. And that's kind of just what happened. And then I, I did a self-tape. I mean, who gets to be on Orange most self-tape? That is like a dream come true. It was just one self-tape and it was like, great, you're hired, come to New York. Basically, yeah. That's incredible. What was, what was like, did you audition with scenes that ended up being in the show or was it just, you know, like on spec? They, no, 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 there were scenes that ended up being on the show, but it was two pages. I did it in an American accent though at that point, the role was American. And it's so secretive that up until the day that I was actually doing my first scene, I got to do my fitting, my scene, and get told that I would be Australian. So I'd done this dialect coach, like every day we're drilling it, I've got these tapes at home, doing all these vowels and wah, wah, and like all these crazy mouth exercises to go in and I'm like, I'm ready. And they're like, and you're Australian. And I'm like, what? I'm like, so yeah, it was pretty crazy. And you literally find out what you're doing each week. Each Monday you read the script and find out whether you're gonna die live, get naked, uh, you know, it, it's like, it's so funny because I would keep coming up and I thought I was the only one, but we, we'd all come up with these brilliant ideas, how to get a script early, because you'd read it and you're like, and I was like, oh, it's like crack, not that I know what crack's like, but you're like, I need the next one, I need the next one. So you'd be like, look, Genji, I really need the next script. Um, something terrible's happened and uh, I just need the next script now because I can't possibly wait. And she's like, mm-hmm, mm -hmm, you'll get it on Sunday. <laughs> and it's like, that was what would happen every single week. How was your American accent when you actually came prepared to do it? Did you feel like, I can be convincing American? I, yeah, I was pretty convinced that it would be, it would be good. Yeah. Uh, but of course I was relieved because this is the biggest, you know, job, the biggest acting role that I've ever had. So being able to take away the American accent and just focus on the acting and just focus on being new to 
one of the like the biggest shows in the world right now. It was it was kind of like thank you Norma because <laughs> I know she made that happen for me. And now you have to do the rest of the interview in an American accent. No, yeah, thanks. No, never. Um, you know what? I was thinking of doing it in a British, British accent, actually. What, I think that every right question in a different accent would be amazing. Uh, <laughs> okay, Borat. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you bring up an interesting point, and when I was watching it, knowing who you were, I did find myself thinking, was this role on some level expressly written for her? I mean, there are things about the character's physicality, you know, your tattoos, that probably informed what Stella did. Did you have any conversations about, with Genji, about how the role was tailored once you had been cast? No, I think, look, from the sides that I was given, it was pretty obvious that she was going to be androgynous, kind of funny, charming, and that she was going to be gay. Mm -hmm. So I think that Choosing to make me Australian was a wise choice because they could make some very funny jokes, <laughs> including jokes about dingoes, if anyone's seen the rest of it. And uh, being able to make fun of me having a Ninja Turtle tattoo was one of my favourite moments when Piper's denying that she has any kind of sexual relations with me by saying, oh, she has a Ninja Turtle tattoo. And I'm like, but I really have one in real life, guys. <laughs> so I don't know how to take this. Like, is this not sexy? Is this something I should be ashamed of? And, uh, and then, of course, the, the Justin Bieber thing. I feel like they wrote that in after the fact. <laughs> Just a guess. That's amazing. Well, speaking of tattoos, there's a, tattoos become a huge part of your storyline towards the end of the season. Uh, there's a great scene when you're actually giving Piper the tattoo where you say, honor the pain of the tattoo. Is that something people with a lot of ink say or is that just something that was her choice to say? I mean, no, that, that's pretty standard that you, like I have, oh man, I don't know, close to 50, maybe 60 tattoos. But when they get close enough together, they just, they're just one. So I basically have three tattoos. If you, that's how I like to say it to all the casting directors. No, it's just three. It's just three tattoos, a little tiny. Uh, it, it is a pretty standard thing. Like if you take it very seriously and there's the hierarchy of the tattoo industry and everything like that, it's very much like you don't, uh, it's not wise to drink before you get a tattoo. You bleed a lot. Uh, it's also not wise to take painkillers and they think you're a pussy. So it is a lot about honouring the pain, um, but I mean, whatever. But I will say this, does anyone here have tattoos? Yeah, you're going to spend a little bit more time in makeup. Yeah. Trust me. But it's fun. Actually, this morning, so apparently I'm just going to host this myself. Hey, Ruby, how are you? What were you doing this morning, Ruby? Well, <laughs> I was at a studio and I wanted to show them that a different side to me because everyone knows that I have tattoos now and everyone knows that I'm Australian. So I, I wanted to go in there with my American accent and I wanted to go in with no tattoos. So I had my makeup art artist cover all of my tattoos and go in for this meeting and it, it really spun people out. But just so you know, there's great technology now. It doesn't take very long. And uh, the weird thing was I look back at the photos and my arms looked like those little Frankfurt sausages. <laughs> like, I don't know why I, without tattoos, look like I have sausage arms. I think it's just in your head, if I'm being honest. Probably. Probably. Um, but I mean, that it brings up an interesting point, because uh, Ashley Harvey was wondering, would you consider playing a role that required you to cover your tattoos, or do you feel like it informs acting choices for you? No, no, I would definitely cover them up. Um, I did a sci-fi that I think is actually airing this Friday uh, called Dark Matter, and we apparently, you can have an Australian android, but they cannot have tattoos. <laughs> uh, and they covered all of my tattoos in this small amount of PVC that wasn't covering my body. And uh, yeah, it, it, I love it, because it allows you to play a different kind of character, and she's a bit of a sex bot, and uh, I, I, liked, I liked having them gone, you know, just for that day not permanently. And there's a few uh, scripts going around at the moment where, you know, you make that decision. You read it and you're like, would that character have tattoos? Would that character not? And I'm lucky because, you know, like we're sort of saying, they're becoming more and more kind of relevant and around. So there's a lot of roles where I'm like, absolutely, that's a badass. You know, she's a badass. Of course, she, you know, she's probably going to have tattoos. I'm not saying that, you know, you could not be a badass without a tattoo. But, and then there's some where if it's like a period piece, I'm not sure. You know, opposite Kira Knightley, and then like <laughs> got my tattoos out in my little corset. Like, Back to the little... British accent again. 
she wore a lot of coats in the 1700s, just fully dressed from right. head to toe at all times. <laughs> um, Trust No Bitch was the title of the finale. It's, title, it's what the tattoo was. Mm -hmm. uh, that sentiment in the world of Orange is the New Black is kind of fantastic. What did you like about the message of that and what it said about the relationships these women have on these shows? What a loaded question. Um, I mean, trust no bitch. I guess, has everyone watched the first two seasons as well? And, and Okay. I think you find, and it's not just in prison, it's in life, but I think especially in that kind of, in, you know, being incarcerated and everyone is very much like, there's cliques, obviously, and there's groups, but it's every man for themselves. Yeah. They're all trying to get out as quickly as possible. They're all trying to be the top dog. They're all trying to, or they're trying to go under the radar and whatever it is. It's kind of like you're never really safe in there. And you may have a love interest or you may have a best friend or you may have someone that you know, is your prison bitch, whatever it is, but you're literally never safe and you always have to look behind your back. And I think in my case, poor, poor Stella. Learn the hard way. I mean, she really shouldn't have trusted any bitch. <laughs> you know, and, and I noticed when I first went in, because like you, you were saying earlier, how secretive it is. Um, I assumed I would be a new new inmate so I was waiting for my orange prison garb and I was like excuse me it's been a mistake you know this is a beige one and they're like no no you've been inside for quite a while now and I was like wow so she's been in there and she's you know kept her head down and she's gone unnoticed for two whole seasons <laughs> and she <laughs> pops her head up because she gets a love interest yeah. you know what I mean and then well it just works out just fantastic I mean like three days shy of getting out of prison right that's so brutal so brutal uh, I mean, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was because she's been there for so long, we kind of don't really learn why she's even there mm -hmm. in the first place. Did you make a choice? Did it matter to your process, sort of what actually got her behind bars? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely made a choice. We had so many. We, <laughs> I swear to God, we would have these like conspiracy theory meetings. It sounds very Illuminati, it's not at all. But we would all sit around and we would, discuss, like, we would decide what was happening in the next episodes because Genji would never give us the scripts early enough. So by then, we would have finished our bits for the week and we're like, okay. And like, if you notice um, Laurie Petty's role, it's, a lot of the time you're starting to think that she's in there to get Alex. And then we had decided that I was in there to kill Alex. So we went on this whole other tangent and every week there were little hints that I was definitely in there to kill Alex. <laughs> And I was like, I don't know how many Apple boxes I'm going to have to stand on when I kill Alex, <laughs> but I'm going to do it. And then suddenly I realized it completely not what happened. But um, with the, the backstories, you know, my friend Jackie, who plays Flaka, she just found out her backstory now, season three. And it was completely off for what she thought her backstory was. And with me, I made a decision based... When did I make the decision? I guess there was no reference to drugs. There was no kind of violence. There was a lot of, I did a lot of mathematics in my scenes, so with the panty business. So I kind of made a decision that she probably was into like money laundering or fraud or something to do with hacking or something to do with numbers because there wasn't really any other evidence that I had for anything else unless she was part of a koala gang. Which happens a lot. Yeah. In America specifically. Correct. I mean, I've heard. <laughs> I have nothing to do with it though. That's right. Um, Question mark sort of at the end of the season, she goes to Max, do you know if you will be back next year? And if you do, I'm sure you can't say anyway. Uh, I actually don't know. I actually literally, well, I mean, they're filming right now and I'm here. <laughs> but just today. So that, <laughs> that's true. But uh, I, I have absolutely no idea. But knowing uh, Genji and, and, and the writers, I mean, literally anything could happen. But I like to think that Stella, if she's staying in Max, has found a good woman that will just love her and not hide old chicken under her bed. It's not a lot to ask, guys. It's not. Whether or not she ends up coming back, Orange is the New Black, I think at this point, has proven to be an incredible launching pad for some of the most gifted actors we have working today and have emerged over the last few years. I mean, coming into a situation like that, as you said, I mean, it was your first big sort of American thing. I mean, you got your SAG card, right, for Orange is the New Black? I did. I got, well, I, I mean, it's in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, I literally think I'm getting it this week. Literally. But I, it's, all, it's all organized and it's very exciting. Like, those three letters are kind of exciting, right? Everyone in here is, yeah. yeah. It's, it's yes. kind of like the rite of passage. It's, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, but what are... 
the pressures coming into a situation like that. The show is not an under the radar show by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, there are billboards in Times Square when it's coming out. I mean, how do you sort of separate the process of acting from the pressure of being the new addition to one of the biggest shows in America? Um, I don't know how I, I kind of like shut myself off from that reality. I mean, clearly when I got the audition, I was incredibly excited. I celebrated the audition. My, my fiance and my friends, they brought me cake and balloons and we all celebrated the audition because that, that was about as far as I thought it would go. <laughs> And then I got the show and then I couldn't celebrate it because I couldn't tell anybody. So that was anticlimactic. And then I got on a plane to New York and because I have been living in LA for the last three years, it was kind of good. I went there by myself. I lived by myself for the first part and my whole life was every day on set, every day with those girls. And you're in a different world. You know, part of it is, um, it, you know, at a studio kind of in Queens. But then the other half is at an abandoned children's psychiatric ward. So it's also very hard to imagine you're on a really big hit TV show when you're in a really freaky place. You really just feel like you're in a really freaky place. So I, I didn't really allow that pressure to mount too much. And you know what, like everyone, and I mean everyone on that show is so sweet and supportive and amazing. It just feels like a little family, it really does. I would imagine that working with Taylor and the other actors is an informal acting school in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. But I mean, for you, are you trained? Do you want more training? Like from an acting perspective, what's important to you about your craft in how you approach a role? Yeah, I, so I started when I was three and I got my Oscar, my first <laughs> Oscar. It's about four. Have you seen Look Who's Talking Now? I mean, you, so good. Yeah, I mean, so I, I was brilliant. Uh, no, look, I, I didn't, I, I hadn't really done a lot of formal studying. Um, I went to VCA, which is a Victorian College of the Arts in Australia, when I finished school and I went there for six months and about halfway through the, you know, halfway through the, the year, which would be six months, half of 12, six. Stella was so, so good, good at math. math. Yeah. Ruby, <laughs> not as much. And uh, I got a job at MTV. So I had to make that decision, you know, do I go on, do I move to Sydney? which to me at the time was like moving to Hollywood and do I host MTV or do I continue, you know, con continue studying and I chose the MTV route and then I've like sidestepped in all these strange directions from like radio to you know hosting to fashion designing to, to all these things to try and get back around to acting and um, I did a couple of short films that really like ignited that passion again and I really decided that's what I wanted to pursue so I moved to the States and um, like anyone that moves to the States, the first thing you get offered <laughs> is a reality TV show. <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't want to do it, <laughs> so I didn't. And the next sort of things that started coming along were along that vein and it, it took two years of sort of saying no to things that I'd already done. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, hosting, presenting and reality stuff. And I just had to keep saying no until I could say yes. Yeah. And I guess that's what happened with, with acting and I just like, that has been my number one goal and I've had private lessons, I've done a little bit of school and now I do school um, with Anthony Mendel who is, who is Here an owl, tonight. who no. is an owl, <laughs> woo, woo. <laughs> Anthony, I said who, uh, and he is amazing and you know he, I don't know, I'm, I'm in his master class but he has you know the beginner classes and then you kind of make your way up and he has so many working, like incredibly well known working actors in there because he is just so good at what he does and I love, 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 love learning from him and in fact I'm, I'm always complaining to my managers that uh, that I, I always get auditions where I get these amazing meetings and they take up my school nights and I'm like, but guys, I have to go to school. <laughs> and like, but also this studio wants to meet you. I'm like, okay. But I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big nerd. I like that. Well, you were talking about sort of that early passion. I mean, did you grow up in a performing family? Just crazy. Crazy and performing, same, same. Sure. Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't, well, my mum's an artist and funny story, but not funny at all. Um, <laughs> funny story, okay, we'll try that one again. Funny story. Uh, my mum worked in a prison for her whole, whole life. 
so what I was going to say is that uh, she was an artist and she never got into acting, never got into singing and I was all about acting and singing and then she got into painting and sculpting and psychology and what I knew that I wanted to do, I had a terrible time in school and I was always bullied, I never fit in and I just knew that I wanted a creative outlet and so I got into drawing and painting and then writing and then poetry and then I wanted to do acting and everyone supported it but no one in my family has kind of done that realm of, of work. And then my first big acting role gets to be in prison. So I was like, Mom, look, I didn't end up in prison, but which, you know, could have happened. But also I can now pick your brain about all the things that you're actually legally not allowed to talk about. Right. So it was great. I like that. I mean, as you were saying before, you had done a lot of hosting and modeling in Australia. I mean, mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's a way, though, to sort of foster that side of your creativity? Because when you're hosting or when you're, there is a performance element to that, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, I feel like I had, I had to do something creative. It was in, I'm a Pisces, and when you get bullied at school as badly as I did, you don't go to school very often, so you don't get great marks. Um, and so my, my first thought was that I wanted to do psychology to be able to give back to the kids, you know, to kids that were in my position at that time. And I, being very uh, passionate and maybe a bit confident, I applied to all the greatest universities and didn't get into any of them. I have no idea why. <laughs> and, but I got into acting school. And then I thought, well, this is how I can do what I want. The changes that I want to make in the world, this is how I can make them, by getting myself a platform. Mm -hmm. And so I, I literally did all these things, like I said before, to get to acting. And I feel like they all taught me different things. You know, uh, the DJing and the singing taught me what it's like to be on a stage and, and to deal with stage fright and pressure and then the hosting got me used to cameras and angles and sound and projection and, and all kinds of things and then um, interviewing actors as well gave me an insight into what it's like so yeah everything in its own little way like helped me get to where I am today. So when you approach a role now when you approach Stella uh, how do you go about building a person that you're about to play do you just sort of try to walk a mile in their shoes do you journal as them? I mean, what is sort of part of your process? Or is it more organic than that? It's sort of just taking the lines and find the truth in them. It's sort of a mixture of all of those things. I'm big on the journaling, though. Yeah. It, I like the journaling because it's really good for my memory as well. So I like to journal with the lines, then I like to journal with whatever mannerisms or actions that I'm going to take in between and like marks that I'm going to hit. I do little, little stick men. <laughs> They're not like Mona Lisa's. They're like literally little monkey men. Um, but I do, I like to journal and then I like to go into depending on what it is, mm -hmm. sometimes if it calls for it, I'll go into great depths of like where this person came from and why they're making the decisions that they're making. And that I think helps a lot <laughs> until you walk in and they're like, so, and they give you the backstory and you're like, mm, so they're not in the Russian mafia. <laughs> they're literally just making ice cream. <laughs> give me a second, <laughs> you know. What do you remember? I mean, although this is sort of thing, you've done films before this, I mean, if someone like you is as creative as you are, what does it feel like that first time you step onto a proper set and are actually hearing action called and getting to breathe the words that you've worked so hard to sort of, you know, journal into existence? Well, there's a reason I, they asked me to choose uh, which episode to play tonight and um, I chose the last one. Because A, I didn't want to have any spoilers. Like, if you watch the first one and then I gave all the spoilers away now, and you'd be like, God damn her. Like, at least now I gave you all the spoilers. <laughs> and uh, secondly, you know, we were talking about this before. Um, of course, when I was, I started in episode six, and I think I was only supposed to do three or four episodes, and I ended up getting to do eight, which is great. But of course, my favorite episode is going to be the last one. <laughs> because that's when I got to do the most amount of work, and I kind of worked myself into that place of comfort but the first couple of episodes I can't even watch really you know I, I, I sit there like I'm watching like it or something and I'm just like uh, am I still on there oh god <laughs> I'm still there and Phoebe and my partner's like you, yeah you're actually on this show but you're, you're, you're gonna keep popping up like any minute and it's it's pretty petrifying you know for that first it, of course it's you know exciting and it's exhilarating and nothing can compete with that kind of like I don't know, it, it, it's, it's a whirlwind, it's so beautiful, but when you have to watch it back later, it's kind of traumatic. <laughs> but you were saying before, like, it's, I think it's good, you know, as an actor starting to watch, because you were saying you get to learn what you do, you don't like what you do, or if you like something you do, you sort of can learn from your own mistakes or successes. 
Yeah. I used to, I did a couple of short films and I had to watch them back. Had to. I mean, you get, it, it's really an honor to be able to shoot, shoot anything and be able to then watch it back. But I had to watch them back. And I, I, know, I used to do this weird thing with my mouth at the end of every conversation. <laughs> Instead of being like a normal person who would talk and then have their mouth be quite like natural and loose, I'd be like, <laughs> it's like I've said my lines and it's like, what are you doing no one does that like what have you got a, what? and it wasn't like for one character it was like any character any every character I do I've journaled very strongly they all do this <laughs> again those Victorian roles will just be amazing <laughs> right I was actually playing a cat's bum in all of them uncanny Right? Yeah, um, I've taken them off YouTube now. <laughs> Cat Bum, that was a fantastic series. If anyone saw it, no, great. <laughs> uh, Tina asks, to date, what has been your most difficult scene? Hmm. I mean, I, I don't know if I had... I feel like I've had more difficult scenes now since the show... Um, when I'm reading and, and, and auditioning for things. I've had some really crazy, crazy scenes. I think maybe the, the last scene in Orange was, was the most difficult because I had to really put myself in a position of being someone that thought that I was gonna get released after however long she's been in there that nobody told me, um, <laughs> which could have, could have been three hours. No, you know, she was about to be released into the real world and now she's going to a prison far worse, a maximum security prison for probably much longer than what she was doing in the first place. And so that was a really strong and, and difficult, challenging, but amazing moment for me because I feel like up until then there was a lot of heart throbby, sexy stuff, but I really, w I wanted to sink my teeth into something with substance and yeah. I got that with that scene. Absolutely. Every, uh, the majority of the rest of the cast sort of got this great cathartic moment to end their season three filming experience on where they're frolicking in the water and everything is wonderful again. And you did not get to do that because you were <laughs> in a prison. I mean, is it hard to exit? Well, wait, but have you spoken to anyone about that, that scene? Why was it the worst? It was the worst scene ever in the history of worst scenes. Why? <laughs> because it was freezing. And all I remember was all of them being like, this sucks. Like, I'm, I'm like, it was like, it, it was New York and it was like negative 1,000 million degrees. I'm like surprised it wasn't ice and they weren't just sliding around on ice. <laughs> like, apparently it was kind of miserable. So at least I just got to be in there kind of crying and then like eat an ice cream and read what everyone else was doing. <laughs> They're like, maybe we should have stolen Piper's money in retrospect. Right? Get out of that scene. Exactly. Uh, but is it hard for you to sort of exit an experience like this on a note that is so intense? You know, were you able to say like, I'm gonna let go of this character who is now going to a horrible place and I feel so much empathy for her. Or are you like, later, I'll see you later, Stella? <laughs> uh, neither. I think I'm glad that it ended the way that it did. I would have been, I, I would have been more disappointed if it ended on like, a, I don't know, a sex scene and then I just didn't come back. Yeah. You know what I mean? It would have just been like, okay, great. I, I came, I winked, I left. Like, I'm glad that I got something that was more powerful to leave with. And it's, it's a memory for me as an actor. It was a memory for uh, people watching it, for people in the industry watching it. They get, they get a little bit more of what I can do, which yeah. is more important to me. Um, because, you know, th there's one episode which I think they wanted to do, but I'm like, I am not doing a Q&A after standing naked in front of everyone for a five-minute dialogue in the bathroom. <laughs> it's not happening. Like, <laughs> what are we going to talk about? My tits? Like, no. Um, Thank you. So if that was the last scene, yeah. imagine, I kind of would have felt a little bit like I didn't get to really sink myself mm -hmm. into it. Um, in regards to am I sad that that's how it, it ended or like, of course I feel bad for Stella, but I mean, like I said, anything could happen. She, she could, it could be like a spin-off series, The Max. Orange is The Max Black. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Genji. I know. I feel like Netflix will be calling that as a very good idea. Right. Norma. <laughs> Moving forward, um, I find it always very interesting, you know, when an actor is in a position like you are, to come off a show like this that is an incredible platform, and I would imagine there's a lot of sort of opportunities mm -hmm. presented. I mean, what is important to you moving forward about the kinds of people you want to play and the kinds of projects you want to be a part of? Um, that's a good question. I guess, look, I, like any actor, I have my list of 
the directors that I would like to work with and the, the, there's the franchises and then there's the independents and then there's other actors that I would love to work with. And I'm in such a blessed position where I'm literally getting to meet these people and have conversations and that's all super exciting to me. And, you know, I think I have, a, I have an amazing team. I have a, a, amazing managers and I think it is about the decisions that you make. You know, you can't just say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. And there's been some roles because... You know, I'm an actor and I'm new. I'm so new. I'm newer than anyone else in this room, probably. And uh, I'm probably the... I am. I'm the, new, the latest person to get their SAG card. Um, and so I'm just like, what? There's a role? And they want me? Let's do it. And they're like, yeah. <clears throat> um, no. And they'll, like, explain to me why it's not a good idea for me to do X, Y, Z. And I'll be, like, a little bit sad for a moment. And then I'll, like, I'll look up on IMBD and realise exactly why I should not be doing that film. So I, I think it's really about working out what makes sense as the next step and then obviously wanting to break, you know, I, I, I want to break stereotypes. Like I don't want to go and play another Stella. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I have been offered another three Stellas. Um, and I would do, you know, that doesn't mean that I don't want to play a badass or I wouldn't be in prison again or I wouldn't be gay or, you know, any of those things. It just means that I know there's so much more to me mm -hmm. as an actor than just playing those roles, which is kind of like why today I went and I met up with somebody not just somebody. I didn't just go like grocery shopping with makeup all over my body. <laughs> but I went and met somebody uh, of importance, you know, looking completely different because I feel like there's there's an art to kind of helping guide their vision because um, they're seeing so many people and they're so busy and they're trying to cast roles and they're going to see you at, the, at face value a lot of the time. Not always, but sometimes. And so if you can help them along by like, you know, hiding tattoos or if I wanted to wear a wig or if I wanted to have freckles or whatever it is, then I'm going to make those changes to help sell, you know, the character that I'm trying to trying to get. No, it's true. I mean, there's been so many people on the stage who will talk about sort of the short-sightedness of Hollywood and how they can really only see you as the last role that you've done. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you're saying, it's very important to sort of diversify. I mean, what... Uh, what kind of women do you want to play? What kind of people do you want to play? Well, I mean, there's not really a, like a limit. There's not only like one or, or two type people. It, like, I, it's funny. I feel like I would totally get overlooked in this genre, but I would love to be in a comedy, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love comedy and I would love to do something with um, like Tina Fey or something, you know, anyone, Amy. Like there's just so many amazing women writing bloody funny films right now and I would love to be in one. Having said that, I also grew up um, loving, you know, Meryl Streep and uh, Julianne Moore and there's, you know, so there's more mature roles that I would like to play and, and drama and uh, really raw, emotional, gritty, like indie pieces. Um, but then I'm also a rev head, so I would love to play, you know, action and like be able to do stunts and like, so I, I don't really have one type of person or one type of character that I want to play it's like I want to be able to at some point like play all of them absolutely. you know yeah. I just said absolutely. You, um, said, you said absolutely said I'm going to say amazing and, and it's an and it's an in joke and now everyone hates me it's perfect um well sort of uh look at, you know in closing one of the things that I always find really interesting is to ask people for you know the best advice they've ever been given but before I do that what is the worst piece of advice someone has ever given you about this industry Just make sure I don't put my foot in it. Uh, <laughs> don't to say who it was. Oh, I was about to give name, address, social oh, security. Oh, great. Okay. Well, let's. I was talk trying about to remember the then. social Bring security. The receipts, was Ruby. The, uh, worst piece of advice. Um, I mean, is there really any such thing as worst advice? Because, it, okay, clearly you have an opinion on that. Uh, I don't know. Because I feel like there isn't. Because it's like it's each to their own, and maybe it's it's bad advice for me, but it's good advice for somebody. It might have worked for somebody. I feel like no one is really well. That could be a lie, but I don't think anyone's going to blatantly give you advice, being like, "Now, I think you should wear a tutu to your next audition with Marty, because I hear he's got a big thing for tutu." Like no one's <laughs> going to like go out there and give you advice, right. meaning to be bad. Um, I think getting the advice that I should stick within, like try and really go the route of badass lesbian with the tattoos is kind of I mean I've been I've heard that a little bit like yeah I really milk that I'm like no, I'm not gonna milk a cow like that's what it sounds like you want me to do you gonna milk milk something no very strange analogy right guys <laughs> glad this is coming to an end um <laughs> and then the best advice I got was just not to get in your own way mm -hmm. you know like 
I have such bad social anxiety. Like, I really do. And I, I have the ability to get in my head a lot and I have the ability to get in my own way. And one of the things I'm learning through school and through meditation and through, you know, all kinds of different channels is actually just to, like, be at one with the process and to let things happen and to be patient and... Yeah, it's kind of, it's working. It's working better than the other way it was. <laughs> well, lastly, let me ask you this. You know, I know you are a very outspoken advocate. And as you were saying, you want a platform to have the opportunity to speak to those people. I think now you've been able to engage in a way through the show that probably is very exciting to you in terms of what you set out to do. I mean, what has it meant to you to have been able to use Orange is the New Black as a platform and a conduit to have these kind of conversations and to talk to your fans and the people who like watching you? Yeah, I mean, that that part is really the, the creme de la creme, you know, and I think Laverne and I kind of share a lot when it comes to that. And I think it's... It's just been beautiful, the conversation that it started. And I was lucky enough, I mentioned earlier that I made a, a short film and it went viral and it kind of, Laverne was on Orange. I released my short film. It ended up getting, it's now at about 60 million on Facebook. It's at about nine or 10 million on YouTube. And it's got a, a sort of gender fluidity, um, transgender kind of theme. And then Transparent came out. And then, you know, the Caitlyn Jenner. There's a, there's a lot of things happening in this movement right now. And I get to be part of that conversation. And that is, it's like a blessing for me to be alive right now and to be able to witness this. And I think anyone within the community and anyone even just that knows somebody, you know, and, and just to be part of it is so spectacular. It's, it's means more than any award or accolade or magazine or talk show, anything that you can kind of get. It's like, this is what it's all about. You know, it's just, it's a really beautiful added bonus. Absolutely. Well, we are also so glad you were part of that conversation, Ruby. And thank you so much for being here tonight. Congratulations on the show. And thank you to all of you for thank you. coming out. Have a lovely night.